Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video, we'll be taking a look at the Asus Prime B550 Plus, a relatively cost effective motherboard for the B550 platform, which might just be the trick for your next build. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so in today's video, we're going to take a look at the Asus Prime B550 Plus um, ATX motherboard you've got a um, pretty decent setup on here there are a few things on here which may be deal breakers for some we'll go through those we're going to do a complete board tour see exactly what is here what is missing what you might want to increase what you might want to upgrade to etc and just basically take an overall view of the motherboard that way then you can see if it's going to be suitable for your next amd build so we go through take a look at the packaging etc all the usual stuff if you've got any comments or questions feel free to reach out to us in the comment section below but with that said let's get on with it so we'll start off with the packaging. Uh, this one is a little bit beaten up. This was actually a Amazon warehouse deal. And I would certainly recommend, if you can, keep an eye on those Amazon warehouse deals. You can get fantastic reductions. At the moment here in the United Kingdom, motherboards are super expensive. Really, really expensive at the moment. So this retails somewhere normally in the region of about 130 to 150 pounds, which in my opinion is way too expensive. So I managed to pick this up. Warehouse deal, uh, battered packaging, etc. One or two little things missing. But essentially, we pick this up for some of the reason, like 60 to 70 pounds, which yeah, is basically half price. So I'm more than happy to have a slightly beat up bit of packaging. As you can see, it is supporting Asus Aurora Sync. So there is addressable RGB on this board, which is always a good thing to see at the slightly lower end of the market. Uh, obviously, B550 chipset. So that supports latest and greatest processors, PCI Express Gen 4, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, this particular board actually, because it is a little bit older, this particular one actually was about two years old. The BIOS level on it was really old. Uh, didn't support things like resizable bar, but with a BIOS update, it now does. So that's excellent. All these things are supported. Out of the box, it only supported Ryzen 3000 series processors. So if you're looking at getting this and possibly working with a 5000 series processor, make sure it has got the sticker on the box or at least check with your vendor, retailer, etc., just to see if it is already 5,000 compatible if you're buying a 5,000 chip. If not, you may be able to get them to do a BIOS flash on it before you get it. Sadly, this particular board doesn't have any form of USB uh, flashback. So if you get it, you are gonna need a compatible processor to start with to actually flash the BIOS. If you wanna see how that is done, uh, we have done a video on that, which you can check out from the video description below or possibly from some cards which will be popping up. Uh, on the back of the box goes through some of the specifications and the layouts, etc. Essentially, you've got the usual kind of deal. So you've got the ASUS Expert 4 system, so Fan Expert, overclocking, all that kind of good stuff. PCI Express Gen 4 included straight off the bat. Also, you've got the USB performance on there. So this does incorporate some USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports on there, Type A and Type C, which is always nice to see. And you've got the five times protection, which is kind of ASUS's thing. So it's anti-static, anti-overpower, all that kind of usual guff. Inside the box normally, you will get all the usual things. So you get the accessories, a couple of SATA cables, your M.2 screws and mounting pillars, a installation DVD and a user manual. Again, because this was a warehouse version, all we had was a couple of SATA cables and a few screws, that was it. The IO shield was included and it does come with the IO shield normally. So uh, it is a separate shield, not a captive one, which some people would have preferred, but again, this is in their kind of lower end of the market. So let's take a tour of the board. So starting off with the top, so we've got an eight pin EPS connector or additional power supply connector for your processor. You've also got these really nice looking heat sinks over the VRM setup. The setup on this isn't quite the best. It's, uh, it's decent, it gets the job done. We're looking at an eight plus two setup on here. The heat sinks could do with being a little bit better to be honest with you, and an extra couple of phases would be welcome. Although this does work fine with things like Ryzen 9. I've actually installed a Ryzen 9 3900X and done some testing on it and it's absolutely fine. And in comparison with this, with my X570 Tough Gaming, the Cinebench scores are basically within a couple of hundred points of each other. So in terms of performance wise, you're probably gonna get pretty much the same as you would with most X570 boards. Obviously, if you're going up to things like a 5950, then the VRMs are gonna take a little bit more of a hammering, but with certainly decent cooling and a lot of airflow, you should keep them under control with those big heat sinks. Obviously in the middle, we've got the AM4 platform socket. So that is gonna support pretty much most processors from the first generation, second, third generation, and potentially further ones as AMD go on. 
We are looking some at the moment of the next version of Ryzen processors coming out, which is going to be AM5, which is going to be a completely different socket. So this is kind of getting towards life support status, although obviously as it was with AM3 and older Intel sockets, a lot of these boards do tend to keep on going and people are still using them, still building with them, so there's no issues there. Um, the AM4 is a tried and tested platform and works particularly well. And now with all the bugs and things ironed out with all the BIOS updates, etc., this is actually a really nice stable platform. So going back to connectivity at the top here, we've got two fan headers. So there's the CPU fan header and also the uh, optional CPU fan header. So if you're maybe using a dual fan setup on your CPU cooler, definitely you can use both of those if you want to. You can repurpose them. So the optional one you can configure in the BIOS and also in ASUS's fan suite uh, to basically do whatever you want to, both in PWM and voltage DC mode. You also next to that, you've got a 12 volt RGB header, so for the older style RGB headers, if you want to use one of those, supported in ASUS Aurora Sync. Moving down, we've got our four RAM slots. So RAM slot wise, this is unusual actually, currently from the ASUS website, which I'll try and link below as well. If you're using a Ryzen 4000 series processor, you can use up to DDR4800 megahertz. If you're using a, a Ryzen 5000 series, then it tops out at somewhere around 4400 megahertz, which I'm not entirely sure why that is. Uh, no idea why that is, but certainly it is way more than the 3600, which most people will be likely to be using on this. You can support up to 128 gigabytes of RAM over the four channels, and it does support dual channel. Moving down, we've got the uh, debug LEDs. These are really handy if you get in a situation where maybe you have bought that 5000 series processor and the system's not booting, then you will get LED notification on there to tell you what's going on. So if it's either the CPU, the RAM, VGA or just your boot device isn't compatible or isn't working then those lights will give you an idea of what is the problem and obviously give you some means of looking into diagnosing it. Underneath that we've got our 24 pin main power connector, nothing unusual there. Underneath that we've got our USB 3.2 Gen 1 port, so that is for your front panel headers, that's going to support up to 5 gigabits per second. Sadly, no USB Type-C on this one, which kind of is unfortunate. A lot of cases now are starting to have USB Type-C front panel headers. But if you do want to add USB Type-C front panel headers, what is known as a Type-E connection, you can easily put one of those into one of the available PCI Express slots. We've done a video on that as well, so you can check out. That'll be linked as well below. Moving across, we've got some more fan headers there. So there's a chassis fan header and also an AIO header. So if you're using a water cooling situation, you can connect the pump directly to the AIO header. And next to that, there is a TPM. If you want to put in a separate TPM module, you can do it on there, although this does support firmware TPM from the processor. Underneath that, we've got our M.2 slot. So this is gonna be PCI Express Gen 4 times four. Obviously, depending on what processor you're using and what lanes it can actually communicate with, if you're using Ryzen 3000 series or 5000 series, generally, as long as it's not a G series processor, then you should get the full PCI Express Gen 4 times 4 from that slot. You can actually use it with SATA drives as well. And usually for this board, not all top slots will support SATA and NVMe, but this will support both and also sizes up to 2211. Underneath that, we've got our PCI Express times 16 slot. So that is PCI Express Gen 4 times 16, obviously backwards compatible with PCI Express Gen 3, depending on the processor you're using, etc., etc. There's also some support there as well. So if you're using a particularly heavy graphics card, they have got ASUS's support on there to keep it a little bit more firmly in place. Moving across, we've got our Prime Series heatsink, which is over the B550 chipset there, keeping that nice and cool. And next that, we've got six SATA ports. Now the SATA ports are all supporting the regular SATA 6 speeds. If for some reason you're using the bottom slot here, PCI Express, then you will lose the ability to use slots 5 and 6 on your SATA headers, but that still leaves you with 4, which I think is probably enough for most people. Moving back across to the PCI Express slots, so these are all controlled from the chipset itself. These two at the top are controlled by the processor. So these ones here are gonna be PCI Express Gen 3 based on the link from the processor to the chipset. So you've got a times one slot there, another times one and another times one. Then you've got a PCI Express Gen 3 times 16 size slot, but it's only wired for times four connectivity. Again, most things are gonna be absolutely fine. It does support AMD Crossfire, although realistically that is pretty much dead and buried. But at the time of this board being designed and actually on the market, Crossfire was still kind of available, although realistically most people don't use it, but if you want to, you certainly can do. We've got our CMOS battery there, so if you do want to do a CMOS reset, if you dial in some settings which are wrong, then you can pop out the battery. That uses a standard CR2032 battery, you can replace those very easily. 
Uh, moving down, we've got another M.2 slot. So this is from the chipset itself rather than being from the processor. Again, this is going to support PCI Express Gen 3 times 4 and also SATA M.2 drives, so you want to use either. And again, we'll support up to 2211 size drives. There are pillars included in the box and screws for mounting all that. Sadly, no heat sinks included for those. So if you do want to have a drive which runs a little bit hotter, then you can buy additional heat sinks on the aftermarket. And a lot of drives these days actually do come with them pre-installed anyway. But certainly, if you do want to keep the drives a little bit cooler, then you might want to purchase a separate heat sink. Again, we've done videos on that, which we'll try and link below. Moving down to the bottom, so this is going to be all of our front panel connectivity and other headers. So we've got our standard front I.O. section here, which is the usual deal. So reset switch, power on, etc, etc. Next up, there is a fan header, so PWM fan header. Next up, you've got two USB 2.0 headers, both supporting multiple ports. Then there is another fan header. Next up, there is a two pin thermal sensor. So you can put a T probe on there if you wanted to. Next that you've got your clear CMOS. So again, if you uh, got your graphics card in, you can't quite get to your CMOS battery, then you can short out those two pins to reset your BIOS. Next to that, we've got the RGB header. So there is a three pin, five volt addressable RGB. That's a gen two port. So for ASUS or Sync, it's a gen two supported. So basically means it can support additional or more LEDs on the strips, etc. Then you've got a older style 12 volt RGB header. Above that, you've got a COM debug port. And next to that, there is a COM port. So if you want to use an older COM port on a serial device, you certainly can do. Moving along from that, there is actually a Thunderbolt header, which is a relatively unusual thing to see, but there is actually a header for it. So if you do want to install a Thunderbolt port on the back of the machine, you can plug in your header into there. So that's excellent. Next to that, you've got your front panel audio connector. Audio is supplied courtesy of Realtek. So that is going to be the Realtek RTL887 chipset. Um, it's not the best out there. Ideally, it would have been preferable to have the 1200 chipset on this, but the 887 is certainly a little bit of an upgrade over the prior versions, the more low-end ones, and does support 7.1 audio and also has a optical speed if. So let's take a look at the I.O. on the back. So relatively decent amount on here. So you've got eight USB ports in total. So at the top here, you've got your USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, Type A and Type C. So that's going to support up to 10 gigabits per second. Next to that, you've got two USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, so that's five gigabit per second, and you've got four of those, two on each side. You've got your Realtek LAN on there, so that's 8111H. Um, nothing great, just gigabit LAN, but yeah, it's absolutely fine. Again, if you want to update to 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, can do. Add-on cards are very easy to get hold of. Uh, again, we'll put links in the video description for that as well, should you wish to do that. You've got two outputs there, so if you're using a G-series processor with onboard graphics, then you can connect up your DisplayPort or HDMI there. So HDMI 2.1 supported and DisplayPort 1.2, both supporting 4K 60 Hertz. Above the other USB ports there, you've got some standard USB 2 ports there. So for older devices which don't need so much bandwidth, such as wireless keyboards and mice, uh, some USB flash drives, that sort of thing, you can use the top two ports there. And next to that, we've got our audio output jacks. So you've got your traditional colors there, and also there is the optical speed if, should you wish to use it. So there you go, there is a tour of the board and the connectivity features, etc. I actually really like this board. I've had it wired up today with a test bench running, done a little video on how to update the BIOS, etc. And everything works exactly as you'd expect. I do like the fact that it's got a decent amount of fan headers on there. So you've got three at the bottom, one on the top there. You've got the extra CPU one, so six headers in total, which I think is personally enough, although you can obviously put splitters on those to add a couple of fans to each one should you want to. The ASUS Fan Expert software, I actually quite like. Uh, it is, for me, preferable over the Armory Crate software. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments section below. Uh, this board works absolutely fine with things like Signal RGB. So if you want to have a implementation with maybe some Corsair kit and various different RGB setups on your system, you can sync it all in there. Works very nicely with Signal RGB. So that's all well and good. Lots of RAM compatibility. So again, up to 4800 MHz, depending on your processor. Yeah, it's just a generally an all-round good board. I personally do like the ASUS Prime brand in. I've had actually quite a few Prime boards. The X370, I've had some Intel boards. And yeah, they they never fail to impress me on how stable the systems can be with them and at a relatively decent price considering normally we do have the ASUS brand tax on most of their equipment. But yeah, definitely, I like this board a lot. There will be a build going on very shortly, a slightly more budget build going on in this. Probably going to end up putting something like a Ryzen 3600 in here, a reasonable system, moderate graphics card, that kind of thing. 
but that doesn't mean you have to. Obviously, if you want to, you can put in here 5900X, I think would be probably where I'd feel comfortable at the top level with a little bit of overclocking due to those VRMs. You can push it harder if you want to, just make sure you've got some decent cooling on there and you should be absolutely fine. Anyway, I think that's gonna wrap it up. Let me know what your thoughts are on this one in the comment section below. I really like it. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video too. If you have, smash the like button. And if you wanna see more content like this on a daily basis, hit the subscribe button and the chime notification and you'll see videos like this in your feed daily. So that's gonna wrap this one up. I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To. And hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.